thanking the dean, thanking the members of the faculty, thanking um, everyone else for having me. Um, it's a distinct honor and um, also a, a pleasure to have the opportunity to um, deliver the, the Goff, the 20th Goff lecture this evening. Um, it's a particular honor because Lord Goff was so distinguished, not just in the field of arbitration, international arbitration, but, but more widely in areas of the law, um, constitutional liberties, other aspects of, of the law, which um, I took, hopefully, um, as part of my inspiration um, for tonight's remarks. Um, I should begin, though, um, with the obligatory effort at a joke. Um, it's, it's traditional, it's orthodox. I'll probably fail at that. Um, um, but I was alarmed to hear um, that the weather, um, which reminds me of London, um, where I just arrived from, um, promised a very long marriage. Um, I had allocated about 50 minutes for tonight's remarks, and a long marriage sounds like a rather longer um, affair this evening. Um, I trust that you all haven't made plans and that you have a lot of patience for um, my, my coming remarks. Um, w with that effort at the obligatory joke, let me turn to, um, to tonight's topic. Um, and what I want to do is examine um, what I've called, um, perhaps um, for purposes of debate, the right to arbitration. Um, it's not always um, conceptualized in that manner as, as a right. Um, and one of the things I'd like to do in, in my talk um, is to explore why one might think about arbitration as, as a right, how that relates to arbitration more generally, how that relates to um, the rule of law and the role of arbitration in, in our society, in international society. And I want to do that in particular by looking at um, historical practice. Um, it's, it's often said that unless, unless you're aware of your history, then you're condemned to repeat it, and in a sense, as, as we'll see from some of the examples I give about how arbitration has been treated historically, um, that may well be the case. There's a, a sort of cyclical aspect to um, arbitration, to international arbitration, when we look at it in different um, jurisdictions, in different settings over time. But the real reason that I want to look at history isn't just because it's, it's of some interest, um, um, and, and has um, amusing um, episodes, but also because it tells us about the present. It tells us about our contemporary um, situation and how we might address, how we might better resolve issues that face us today, that face us here and now. And so what I'd like to do then is begin with, um, begin with disputes. They are tragically a reality in almost all of our relationships, whether they're personal relationships, whether they're commercial, business, economic relationships, whether they're religious or community relationships, almost any relationship that man or woman um, can conceive is subject to um, disputes, which can disrupt and, and in, in some cases render dysfunctional those relationships. And resolving disputes is um, one of the necessary roles, not just of, of the individuals that are parts of those relationships, but also of the state, um, the state which holds itself out as the last resort for the resolution of, of disputes between its citizens. And for the most part, dispute resolution is not a happy, um, <clears throat> a happy assignment, not a happy vocation. Resolving disputes requires dealing with, with parties, usually who are at the, the end of their wits, uh, if not the end of their legal budgets, and attempting to bring order, bring peace, to individuals who have fallen out in their relationship. And the task of resolving disputes, the task of, of dispute resolution, is necessarily an imperfect one, necessarily one that won't make everyone happy, 
necessarily one that will involve some continued disruption in the relationship, necessarily one that will cost time and money that might otherwise be productively spent. Um, and that's been true historically uh, no less than, than it is today. One of the key uh, mechanisms, one of the key means for resolving disputes historically, just about as far back as history reaches, has been arbitration, has been the use of decision makers chosen by individuals, individual parties to a relationship to resolve their dispute between the two of them, the three of them, or however many it may be, as opposed to having resort to the last resort, to the courts of, of the state, the country, the nation, the empire, whatever it may be. And it, it doesn't matter what part of the world one looks to or what historical era one looks to, arbitration in the sense of arbitrators chosen by individuals to resolve their dispute in the way that they wish has been a characteristic feature. One can go to classical Greek and Roman antiquity and find examples, whether it's in Homer or early mythology, of either gods or humans. Paris was a particularly unhappy early choice of arbitrator. Um, resolving disputes between individuals. One can look on cuneiform tablets in what's today Iraq and see border disputes between farmers resolved with awards of a dozen silver shekels and a goat being issued to resolve a dispute between prehistoric um, or almost prehistoric Iraqi farmers. One can find in more recent times the trade guilds in Europe. One can find the use of arbitration in the Middle East in Jewish and other religious communities, the Bet Din of today. Um, one can find in disputes between states, the city-states of classical Greek antiquity, the use of arbitration to resolve disputes between either individuals or businesses, or even countries. Equally, today, one sees the use of arbitration in a wide range of, of different fields. And much of this will be familiar, but one can look in the commercial fields. And virtually every developed commercial jurisdiction today has robust use of arbitration to resolve business disputes, to resolve commercial disputes between companies. And one can see internationally even more clearly where the New York Convention, the United Nations Convention on the Recognition and Enforcement of Foreign Arbitral Awards has provided a sort of global constitution to underpin the use of international commercial arbitration to resolve disputes between businesses of different countries. And one evidence, one solid indicia of the popularity of arbitration today is the steadily increasing um, caseloads at leading institutions around the world, whether it's the Hong Kong International Arbitral Center, the Singapore International Arbitral Center, the ICC in Paris or elsewhere. These caseloads have, if you look at say the top 15 arbitral institutions in the world, have increased from in 1993 a total number of cases of around 1,400 to 2,000. Um, a total caseload of around, around 5,400, and last year a caseload of 8,300. At the same time that the, quant the size of cases, the value and complexity of cases has also increased very substantially. And I think one only has to look to the HKIAC here in Hong Kong and to the robust arbitration, international arbitration community seated here in, in Hong Kong with the law firms and, and the bar to attest to the robust popularity of international arbitration, commercial arbitration in, in today's world. It's not just in the commercial realm, though, that arbitration has, has been turned to. It's also in an increasingly wide range of subject matters. Investor state arbitration, a field which 30 years ago almost literally did not exist, has gone from a caseload of almost no cases a year 
to a caseload today, whether at ICSID or under the UNCTRAL rules and otherwise, of more than 150 disputes filed each year, often involving sensitive issues of rights of foreign investors vis-a-vis -vis host states. Um, in addition to the burgeoning world of investment arbitration, one's also seen increasing resort by states and quasi-state actors to the use of arbitration to resolve disputes between, between sovereign entities, whether it's Eritrea and Yemen attempting to resolve a dispute over sovereignty with respect to islands at the southern tip of the Red Sea, the so-called Zuckerhanish, um, arbitration or the ABA arbitration involving the rights of South Sudan vis-a-vis -vis the North. Um, interstate arbitration has, much as it was in classical Greek antiquity, increasingly been turned to. And at the same time, one can look also to other, other subject matters, which again, 30 years ago, simply were not subjects of, of arbitration as a means of dispute resolution. Sports arbitration, the Court of Arbitration for Sports, seated in, in Lausanne, Switzerland. Here's literally hundreds of sports-related cases every year, it's applying novel forms of alternative dispute resolution to resolve a whole range of, of sports disputes, some of which may seem minor, but often which involve um, issues of huge personal and sometimes financial importance to athletes, to viewers, to to Olympic participants around the world. Um, financial services and aviation, areas which historically, like intellectual property, had not been used for arbitration, have increasingly in the past 10 years, whether it's with the World Intellectual Property Organization, WIPO, again, seated in Switzerland, um, or IATA's use of model arbitration provisions in interline and other agreements between airlines, um, seen the, the use of alternative dispute resolution mechanisms um, to resolve a whole range of new disputes which in the past were not the subject of arbitration. Double taxation treaties between sovereign states involving some of their most important sovereign authority, the power to tax, often include arbitration clauses um, in order to resolve disputes over which country has jurisdiction to tax particular nationals of, of one state or, or, or both states. And there are nearly a dozen double tax um, disputes between states being arbitrated as, as I speak today. And one can look into more um, arcane, if you will, examples of arbitration in particular jurisdictions. Class action arbitrations in the United States is, is one example. Um, Interpol, of all things, includes arbitration clauses in a number of its agreements with, with member states. And so what one sees then um, is a very widespread and increasing use of arbitration um, to resolve all manner of disputes. And one can ask, therefore, why? Why is it that, that parties, such a wide range of parties in such a wide range of areas, over such a wide range of historical experience have turned to arbitration to resolve their disputes. There are other means, obviously, of resolving disputes. States can submit their disputes to the International Court of Justice. One could create an international investment court. <coughs> National courts obviously provide a means to resolve business disputes or religious disputes. Why is it that parties choose instead to arbitrate? And why is it that nations um, both by treaty and legislation and judicial decisions affirm and give effect to those agreements to arbitrate. We of course know some of the reasons. Um, efficiency and cost is one. Parties believe, sometimes rightly, sometimes not so rightly or uncertainly, that arbitration is quicker and cheaper. Um, and there are various empirical um, studies that, that bear out, at least to some extent, um, those analyses, and they may have particular force in the international context, but they're ones also that, that um, hold, hold force as well in, in, in at least many domestic settings. Expertise. Um, parties can choose the arbitrators that they believe most suited to, to resolve their dispute, and the parties, of course, know better than anyone else the particular types of expertise, the particular types of issues that will resolve and who it is what individuals, what arbitrators will have the best skills, insurance, arbitration, 
commodities arbitration, construction arbitration, calling on particular sets of substantive abilities that not everybody may possess. And by um, residing confidence in arbitrators with those qualities, one obtains um, the party's hope and, and one, one certainly also hopes a better decision. And finality, enforceability, in addition to being quicker and, and more expert, arbitration promises to be more final, to produce a decision not, not subject to layers of appellate review, subject instead to rapid enforcement, and again in the international context, subject to global enforcement through the New York Convention, the global constitution which guarantees the enforceability of arbitrations in, in 155 contracting states around the world. And so what one sees and what one has seen over, in particular, the last 30 years, um, dating back um, before that to the New York Convention, adopted or drafted in, in 1958 and then progressively ratified by, as I've already mentioned, 155 contracting states today, given effect on a national level through arbitration legislation, whether it's the UNCTRAL model law and international commercial arbitration, a variant of which is, is in force here in, in Hong Kong, or other national legislation that gives effect to the two basic foundations of, of arbitration, gives effect to the validity of arbitration agreements on one hand, at the beginning of the process, gives effect to the, the validity of arbitration awards on the other hand, at the end of the process. Um, allowing the party's agreement to arbitrate, um, um, to have practical force, practical reality. I mean, most fundamentally, um, states have um, um, undergirded, have given effect, have honored um, agreements to arbitrate and arbitral awards because arbitration advances the rule of law, because it holds parties to their contractual commitments, because it enforces the legal system in areas, particularly in the international context, where it may otherwise be difficult to do so, and because it resolves the party's disputes. Now, one in a sense might think I could stop there. It's a wonderfully rosy picture, and um, it is um, an upward trajectory in terms of, of case loads, in terms of new areas in which disputes are subject to, for the most part, um, satisfactory resolution. The voluntary compliance with arbitral awards is on the order, according to most, most um, researchers, of 90, 95 percent. Um, and, and parties certainly are voting, if not with their feet, are voting with their contractual agreements, voting with their arbitration clauses to continue to use arbitration. And so why is it that, that one might question whether whether those, um, that, that contemporary perspective um, is an enduring one or whether there are um, reasons to doubt its, its longevity, reasons to doubt the, the, the duration of that particular marriage. And the reason is that, that one, one ought to pause and think about why it is we have this commitment to arbitration is that there are often uh, there have been in the past and there continue to be doubts expressed um, um, in, in particular um, circles about arbitration as a means of, of dispute resolution. And I'd like to look at those doubts and how they have emerged and re-emerged over history and the for different forms that, that they take. Um, because unless we pay attention to, to the past, we will, as I've said, be condemned to, to relive it. Um, one of the, the fundamental themes of criticisms of arbitration, um, uh, which has led to refusals historically, and this continues frankly today, to recognize and enforce arbitration agreements, to recognize and enforce arbitral awards. One of the themes has been that arbitrators, in fact, do not advance the rule of law that arbitrators are not um, sufficient safeguards for the rule of law and that they lack the confidence of the public defined in, in some fashion, that they don't really deliver justice and rather they deny justice 
um, to ordinary citizens, and that therefore agreements to arbitrate ought not to be upheld or ought to be upheld subject to very onerous limitations, and that conversely, arbitral awards ought not to be recognized because it is a process that does not promote but instead frustrates justice. And let me start um, my, my overview of, of how those, those views have been expressed with a quotation from, from the 1840s. It's an 1845 decision from, from um, the United States by one of the great um, American um, legal thinkers and also ultimately justices in, in, in the United States Supreme Court. Joseph Story, who said as follows, now we all know, said Joseph Story, that arbitrators at the common law possess no authority whatsoever even to administer an oath or to compel the attendance of witnesses. They cannot compel the production of documents and papers and books of account or insist upon a discovery of facts from the parties under oath. They are not ordinarily well enough acquainted with the principles of law or equity to administer either effectively in complicated cases, and hence it has often been said that the judgment of arbitrators is rusticum judicum, rough justice. And as a consequence, Justice Story concluded, much like other common law decisions in the United States and other places, that agreements to arbitrate were effectively unenforceable. Parties might agree to them, but courts would in fact not hold parties to those agreements because ultimately arbitration didn't really provide justice in the way that national courts, in the way Justice Story's court um, would provide. Um, and one saw, and, and we're going to look at this in a few moments, one saw similar um, echoes of this view in, seven, in, in the 1900s, 1800s in, in France and, and Germany as well and in, in other countries um, in addition. The basic thought was arbitration doesn't promote the rule of law, doesn't provide justice, doesn't provide access to justice. Instead, arbitration is at best rough justice or no justice at all and therefore we ought not to encourage and instead should discourage it. And now my basic thesis um, tonight is that that view is entirely wrong and that the collective legislative and judicial judgments of the last 20 years rest on very solid foundations and that it is right to give effect to agreements to arbitrate because they in embody and deserve recognition as an expression of a right to arbitrate. And that that right to arbitrate arises out of, is grounded in the freedom of contract, the freedom of association, the freedom of individual autonomy that lies at the foundation of the rule of law. And that this right to arbitrate deserves and has received the respect of legislatures and courts, whether in Hong Kong or elsewhere, because it reflects the same respect for the freedom of individuals to choose who they contract with, what the terms of their contract are, who they associate with, who they pray with, who they go to church, synagogue, mosque, what have you with, who they enter into communities with. The law, the basic rule of law, protects the autonomy of individuals to structure their relationships. And just as importantly, when those relationships inevitably fall on hard times, when it rains during the marriage, to mend those relationships. Deciding how you mend a relationship, how you resolve the problems that inevitably arise out of any contract, out of any marriage, out of any community, um, is just as important a part of the autonomy to enter into as it is to enter into that relationship and decide whether you're going to end that relationship. And the right to arbitrate, the right of individuals and communities to decide how they wish to resolve the disputes in their relationship is just as important as the right to be able to enter into those relationships. And it is for that reason, I would suggest, and I'm going to look at a series of historical 
examples to give, give um, substance to this, to give support to this. It is for that reason, most fundamentally, that arbitration has become such an important aspect of national life, whether it's here in Hong Kong and or elsewhere, and international life, because it is an expression of the freedom to associate and the freedom to contract. So, where do we start? Let's start in France, um, because it is one of the um, historic places that one looks to for, for inspiration. Um, it was once said by someone far wiser than I that it's still too early to tell what the results of the French Revolution may be. But I think we can draw some conclusions nonetheless from aspects of the French Revolution. The Constitution of Year One, the first embodiment of the French Revolution, provided in Article 86, no encroachment can be made upon the right of citizens to have their matters in dispute decided upon by arbitrators of their own choice. One of the first and most important principles of the French Revolution, giving recognition to the rights of liberty, equality, and fraternity, was the right to arbitrate. One might be surprised by such prominence